Good evening and welcome. I want to thank each one of you for attending this evening. We're looking forward to a wonderful blessing as we go through the seminar, A Thinking Generation. In just a little bit, I'll introduce our speaker. Um, tonight, let's begin by singing a couple songs. Number 539, I Will Early Seek the Savior. Number 539, I Will Early Seek the Savior. I will learn of him each day. I will follow in his footsteps. I will walk the narrow way. Let's all sing together. Welcome those who just came in. And please turn with me to number 216. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. I was looking at the flyer here, educating or preparing our children for heaven. And what a wonderful thing to know that each one of our family could be ready when Jesus comes. And when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and the roll is called up yonder, to know that I will be there and our families can be there. So let's sing tonight, number 216, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there.
This evening is the first of several presentations over this weekend entitled Educating for Eternity. And there are so many educational opportunities that don't educate for eternity. But as Christians, we know that this is not our home, is it? We have a home in heaven, and we are more concerned about being ready for heaven than we are for this life, aren't we? And we especially want to welcome our speaker this evening, Joshua White. If you had a flyer, which you most likely did since you're here this evening, you'll notice that the... Um, web address for his ministry is a thinkinggeneration.org and what a wonderful opportunity to realize that God wants us to use our minds and our hearts and our whole beings to serve him he wants us to understand the principles of true education and family life and he wants us to think and to follow him intelligently um, some of the topics here tonight at 7 p.m. which is right now educating royalty children of the Heavenly Father, right? And then Sabbath morning, we'll have 9.30. During the Sabbath school time, it will be end time mind control. 11 a.m. worship service will be Daniel chapter 0. And uh, that's interesting, isn't it? We know about Daniel 1 and 2, but what about before that? So we will look forward to that message. 2 p.m., the second generation. 3.30 tomorrow afternoon, we'll be putting your child on God's schedule. Um, 6 p.m., Malachi, an urgent message. And there will also be a um, fellowship meal right after church. It will be haystacks tomorrow. And then um, tomorrow evening, there will be a light supper. So we welcome you to come and also bring some fruit and bread, popcorn, things like that to contribute. So we look forward to the whole weekend. There's also a special feature on Sunday morning, um, 9.30 a.m., created for communion. 10.30 a.m., the winning team in true education. So Joshua White comes from a distance to meet with us this weekend and to present. Um, he's an educator, the director of A Thinking Generation, um, a ministry that provides seminars, consultations, and media material to help families and schools around the world understand and follow God's method of true education. So it's just such a privilege to have you here tonight. We welcome you, and we look forward to the messages. It is a pleasure to be here in Hayden Lake. Good evening. Educating royalty. I'd invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and we are going to look going to read um, verses 16 and 17. Before I begin, though, and before we read the Word of God, let's have a word of prayer to get started. Father in heaven, as we open your Word this evening, and as we study the beautiful counsel that you've given us, as we seek to understand your plan of educating us, not just for this earth, but more importantly, educating us for heaven, we recognize that all of these truths are great and profound and deep topics which we in our sinful state cannot understand without your help. So Father, we ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit this evening. Please open our hearts and minds, clear away the rubbish of preconceived opinions or worldly education or anything that may impede you speaking to us, please, Lord, open our hearts and minds to receive your truth. Please speak through me, I ask. I pray you'll give me the, your words. May, my, may this presentation be from you and not be my own. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Romans chapter 8. Verse 16 and 17 tells us that the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may, also, may be also glorified together. Children of God, the Bible tells us. Children of the king of the universe. Now, what do we call 
individuals here on this earth who are children of a king, princes and princesses. We call the family of a king royalty. The Bible here is calling us royalty. But it doesn't stop with that. It is furthermore telling us that we are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. In other words, heirs of an eternal kingdom destined to reign with him. That's a high destiny. Now, if we look at the families of royalty here on this earth, they are very careful how their children are educated, are they not? They take great pains to send them through the best programs of education. Every detail of their upbringing is laid out carefully, all with the purpose of preparing them for their destiny as a ruler someday. But how much more careful should we maybe be (laughs) if we are heirs of an eternal kingdom? Should we not give careful attention to the education of those who are heirs of a heavenly kingdom? Perhaps even more so than those who are heirs only of an earthly kingdom? So tonight we're going to begin looking at some of these principles of how we prepare those heirs of the kingdom. We're going to focus on true education this weekend, but I I, I want to clear something up briefly, because when you talk about true education, uh, many of us may immediately think, well, I'm not a teacher, so this doesn't apply to me. (laughs) Is true education only for teachers? Well, let's look here. We're told that in his wisdom, the Lord has decreed that the family shall be the greatest of all educational agencies. (laughs) So is true education for teachers? Well, yes, but is it primarily for teachers or is it primarily for parents, right? It's more for the parents than for the teachers because the family is the greatest of all educational agencies. Okay, so true education is for parents and teachers, but maybe you're saying, well, I'm not a teacher and I'm past that stage of life where I'm dealing with my little children, so really this probably doesn't apply to me. Wait just a moment. In the school of Christ, students are never graduated. You're not a teacher or a parent, maybe, but every one of us should be students in the school of Christ. Among the pupils are both old and young. Those who give heed to the instructions of the divine teacher constantly advance in wisdom, refinement, and nobility of soul, and thus they are prepared to enter that higher school where advancement will continue throughout eternity. And here we have one of the major distinctions between worldly education and heavenly education. In worldly education, what are you focused on? Graduating. In heavenly education, you don't graduate. Because God has created us with the power of continual advancement in heavenly things, continual growth. I don't even understand how that's possible. But the point is, true education is for every single one of us. Now, there's even a greater, a deeper reason why it's for every single one of us. We're told that in the highest sense, the work of education and the work of redemption are one. Now, how many people does redemption apply to? Everyone, all who choose, all who want it to apply to them, all who accept it. So, (laughs) if true education and redemption are one and the same, then true education definitely applies to everyone who wants to be prepared for heaven, everyone who wants to be redeemed. But there's more. This one is, this next statement is something that I have studied and pondered, and it just keeps getting deeper. It's solemn. Now, as never before, we need to understand the true science of education. If we fail to understand this, we shall never have a place in the kingdom of God. I should make us stop and think. Never have a place in the kingdom of God? Is true education important? (laughs) Is true education a salvational issue? You know, we get in these discussions. What's salvational, what's not, you know, I'm not going there. But this is a salvational issue. This concerns 
our preparation to enter heaven. Now, this also tells us some important things, three things in particular. First of all, it tells us about the content of true education. This tells us that the content of true education is not entirely about the academic things like math and science and history and so, those such things. Because God has not, praise the Lord, God has not made algebra an entrance requirement for heaven. I should have heard a louder amen to that because a lot of us wouldn't make it, right? <laughs> Thankfully, the content of true education, if it is necessary for us to enter heaven, must concern far more than just a few academic things that we usually associate with education. But secondly, it says, now as never before, we need to understand the true science of education. Why now as never before? I mean, this is telling us that it used to be important, but now it is more important forever uh, than ever. Now it is more urgent than it ever has been. Why so urgent? What is the urgency of true education? If you study the nation of Israel and you look at why they rejected Jesus, many times we answer that question very superficially. Oh, it was their pride you know, or something like that. But when you study what actually formulated their beliefs, what brought them to the point that they were as a nation, it becomes clear, I mean, it's, it's plain in history, that slowly, over hundreds of years, during that intertestamental period between Malachi and Matthew, they allowed worldly methods of education to begin to influence their God-given system of education. They began to be very influenced by Greek systems of education, which teach one, among many things, to be self-sufficient, to not need salvation. And among many things, again, it's a long study we don't have time for right now, but it was false education that caused the Jews to reject Jesus as the Messiah. It was false education that brought the Jews to the point where they did not recognize Jesus when he came the first time. Do you think that if Satan worked so hard to bring in false education so that the Jews would not recognize Jesus when he came the first time, do you think he might work extra hard in the last days to bring in false education so that God's professed people will not recognize Jesus when he comes the second time? Now, as never before, we need to understand the true science of education. It concerns our preparation to recognize Jesus, to be ready for Jesus when he comes. And of course, we know the purpose of true education in uh, fitting workers to finish the work on this earth. Uh, again, that's part of you know preparing that generation to finish the, the work is part of the urgency of true education. Point number three, though, this also tells us that true education is simple. Why is it simple? Because if it is so important that we understand true education, if it is a requirement to enter heaven, do you think that true education is something very complicated that only a few people can understand, and only the very fortunate who have enough money to access special curriculum and things like that can follow it. No, of course not. If true education is necessary for our redemption, it will be simple and something that everyone can access. And this is an important point, because we like to overcomplicate true education. And we like to say, here's the true education textbook, here's the true education curriculum, True education is not a curriculum. There is no curriculum for true education. Nor where will there ever be. And that's a whole other study we don't have time to get into. It is not possible to have a curriculum that follows true education because that steps outside of the lines of true education to just have a curriculum. But true education is not a textbook. True education is not a certain program. It's not a certain method. Those things are the methods of the world's education. The education of the world is complicated. The education of the world, you need materials and curriculum and tutors and teachers and all those sorts of things. But true education is simple. Why? Because it's God's method, and God's method is attainable for everybody. 
If true education required all this complicated stuff that only few people can access, it would not be fair on the part of God to require it for entrance to heaven. Did, did we catch that point? If true education requires all this stuff that we like to say, oh, you need this and you need that, you need that, but only some people can access that, it would not be fair on the part of God to require an understanding of true education to enter heaven. What do we all have access to? The Word of God, right? We're going to see tomorrow. This was the core of Daniel's education. And it's something we can all access. I'm not saying we can't access some resources that are helpful to us, but it's important that we understand that true education is simple because we are educating royalty. We are preparing a generation to enter heaven and to finish the work. And you know, as Seventh-day Adventists, we are very blessed with this message on true education because we've been given this job of educating royalty and we've also been given this message that is the greatest, most profound, and most detailed message on education ever entrusted to the world. The principles of true education, of course, are as old as the world and they were applied in the Garden of Eden and in the life of Abraham and the children of Israel all down through history. But it was made much more clear for our modern times through the pen of the spirit of prophecy. And of course, these principles are found in the Bible. They are substantiated now by modern brain research, and I'm thankful for all that that is available to us. But it is gratitude, not pride, gratitude definitely, that motivates me to acknowledge that there is a special added clarity given to the message on true education through the spirit of prophecy. It is a unique and special end time message that has been given us, and I'm thankful for that. And while there are many books and compilations on the topic, there is one that far surpasses them all, the one simply called Education. How many have read this book cover to cover? A few of you. That is um, more hands than I'm used to seeing, actually. And I'm blown away because this is our textbook on true education, right? If we want to understand true education, we need to study this. But we tend to have the idea this is for teachers only, <laughs> but it is definitely not. It is a life-changing book for anyone. But this book, amazingly, has been hailed by educators around the world as far ahead of its time. It has been used to reshape education in countries around the world. I'll give a few examples. Educational leaders in the state of Mysore, India, used the book Education to shape their philosophy of education when they gained independence in 1947. I'm told during a time of significant change in the educational system of Ghana, Africa, Educational leaders were, um, well, I should say, educational leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church were at one point visiting the Secretary of Education for the nation of Ghana. And they were surprised to see a well-worn copy of the book Education on the Secretary of Education's desk. And they asked about it. And he said, well, that's where I'm getting all these changes we're making in the country. <laughs> Professor John McAllis of the University of California, Berkeley, stated that he found the book Education to be ahead and better than his own book on education, though it had been written 50 years previous. And Dr. Florence Stratemeyer of Columbia University, world-leading curriculum authority, also stated she found the book Education to be 50 years ahead of its time. She's a Roman Catholic. One time, she was asked to give a lecture on education to a group of Seventh-day Adventist teachers. Her source for the principles of education that she laid out in her talk? The book Education. She stated, speaking of the book Education, the breadth and depth of its philosophy amazed me. This is one of the world's leading educators. Its concept of balanced education, harmonious development, and of thinking and acting on principle are advanced educational concepts. The objective of restoring in man the image of God, the teaching of parental responsibility, and the emphasis on self-control in the child are ideals the world desperately needs. <laughs> Friends, the rocks are crying out. We should be supremely thankful for this precious resource. We should be on the edge of our seats. Yes, Lord, what do you want to tell me about this plan of education that is going to prepare us for heaven? Now, 
Before I get into the principles of true education, I want to mention one other important thing. Because when one says true education, what does that by default indicate? There's a false, right. When you say something is true, that indicates there must be a false. So, in fact, I was uh, listening to the testimony of, of a mother recently, and she was saying, I, one time I heard that, or she said, when I first heard the term true education, she said, I scratched my head and I said, what are you talking about? You mean there's a false education? <laughs> we tend to view education as something that's just about putting information into the mind. We don't really view it as a moral issue. But it absolutely is because we need to remember that the Bible tells us that there's a great controversy, a controversy between Christ and Satan, a controversy between good and evil. And there are two kingdoms at war with each other in this universe. And there are two governments at the head of these kingdoms. And at the head of these governments is a leader. And the foundational principles of operation of these two governments are diametrically opposite. And it would not be possible for the educational system of one government to prepare citizens to function in the other government because they're opposed to each other, right? That's not possible. It would not work for one government to prepare citizens to function in a government which it fundamentally is opposed to. So, there is a true education and a false education simply by the fact that there's a great controversy. And sometimes we tend to miss that point. Which kingdom, which government, which side in the great controversy are we being prepared for? Because education concerns our preparation to function in one government or the other. And let me put that a little more clearly. It concerns our preparation for heaven or our preparation for this earth only. Now, true education will prepare us to be a good citizen of this earth. But false education stops with preparation for this earth. True education maintains its highest goal as preparation for heaven. But the point that is important for us to understand is that True education, well, let me say it this way, education is not merely informational. Education is transformational. Satan knows this too, right? God and Satan both understand this. It doesn't matter which system of education you're part of, it will transform you for one kingdom or the other. The question is, which system are we being a part of? And it's solemn to consider that we are told the reason why the youth of the present age are not more religiously inclined is... I've stopped there. Why is it? We all want the answer to this question, right? We have sermons written on this topic. Why are the youth leaving the church? We, have, we, we could fill a library with the books written on this topic. The ideas that are out there, the methods, the plans we have for bringing our young people back into the church. Do we want to know why? Whose answer do we want? Man's ideas or God's answer? I hope we all want God's answer. It's kind of painful. <laughs> the reason why the youth of the present age are not more religiously inclined is that their education is defective. Oof. And as I thought about that, I thought about the statement that we started with, which told us that in his wisdom, the Lord has decreed that the family shall be the greatest of all educational agencies. Wait a minute. If the reason our youth are not interested in spiritual things is that their education is defective, but the greatest educational agency is the family, what has failed? Ooh. <laughs> now that could be really discouraging, but I don't want to leave it at that. You know, oh, the family failed, and, and look at the problems it's created. It's true. But this also, to me, gives us hope, because if a failure in the family to proper, properly educate our young people to be interested in spiritual things. It's, I said that wrong. 
if a failure in the family to properly educate our youth is causing a lack of interest in spiritual things, then a proper following in true education in the family will create an interest in spiritual things in our young people, right? So this is telling me we hold it in our hands, we have it in our power to create a spiritual interest in our young people by simply following God's methods of true education. Okay, so what is true education? <laughs> Let's go through some of the basics. This is a study that, you know, when I teach this class at mission schools, we'll spend 20, 30 hours studying this topic, just going over the basics, really. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot that we can cover. But I want to just break this down into three primary core components. First of all, true education and redemption are synonymous to restore the image of God in the soul. Two, true education is the harmonious development of the physical, mental, and spiritual powers. And three, true education is preparation for service here and throughout eternity. Within these three principles are many other principles, but uh, we find that these are the main principles of true education and all educational goals should fit into these three principles. So let's analyze them uh, individually. Let's look at this first principle. True education and redemption are synonymous. To restore the image of God in the soul. I did not make this up one night when I couldn't sleep. That comes right from the book Education that says, in the highest sense, the work of education and the work of redemption are one. So we can right here begin to have a standard of measurement for an educational system. We can say, is this program, is this textbook, is this activity, any part of our education, is it focused or will it aid in redemption, the restoration of the image of God in the soul, or will it lead the other direction? That can be a standard of measurement for whether or not something is part of true education. We read the true object of education is to restore the image of God in the soul. Now, why is this? We find the answer to that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. God created man in his own image. Now, we know what happened to the image of God in man when sin entered this world. The Spirit of Prophecy says it has been nearly obliterated. You almost can't see it anymore. So something must be, must be done to restore it. And we read to restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back to the perfection in which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind, and soul that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. This was to be the work of redemption. Now pause right there. We all know that, right? Restoring the image of God in the soul, that's the work of redemption. Everybody agrees there. But what's fascinating is it connects them by continuing. It says this is the object of education, so both redemption and education have one goal, restore the image of God in the soul, bring man back in body, mind, and soul to the perfection in which he was created. But it didn't stop there, did it? It says this is the great object of life. Our entire existence here on this earth should be focused on preparing us for heaven. Our entire existence should be focused on restoring in us the image of God so that we are fitted for heaven. So how do we do this? Let's get a little more practical. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10 tells us, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. All right, wisdom and understanding, these are educational terms. What is the fear of the Lord? What is it? Any thoughts? It says those who fear the Lord trust the Lord. He is their help in distress. Okay, wow. So we're recognizing his character, right? getting to know who he is, recognizing his character. I believe it is also uh, recognizing his authority and the justice of his government, the rightness of his laws, the happiness in following his laws. It's knowing God and trusting him. One more thing. Yes. Amen, amen. So there we go again, connected with uh, respecting his laws and his government, yes. That says, though, <laughs> is that the completion of wisdom? It, that's the beginning. That's just where we start. And then it says, the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Now, this word knowledge, fascinating. When we hear the word knowledge, we just think of information about something, right? <laughs> but in the Hebrew mindset, when he uses the word knowledge, this is talking about 
intimate relationship with someone. Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived. So it's telling us that if we want understanding, we need to enter into intimate relationship with God. That's true education, connected with the source of wisdom. The very foundation of true education is in the fear of the Lord. Now let's talk about this idea of a foundation. How many here have built a house? Has anyone built, built a home, built their own home? Okay, one of us. Um, and maybe those of you who haven't built one, you know how it's done. You've, you've seen the process. You're familiar with it. Imagine that you were going to build a house, but as you were uh, planning this process, you realized that you didn't have enough money to complete it. I think Jesus gave an illustration about that, right? Count the costs. So you counted the cost. You realized you didn't have enough money. So you began to think, okay, I really need to, to build a house, so I'm going to have to leave off a few parts, uh, and that'll have to wait till later. Or, you know, maybe just not even get to it as life happens that way. So you think about this, and okay, what parts can I leave off of my house? Well, I need walls. Can't have a house without walls. I need a roof. That's pretty essential. Doors and windows... Yeah, that's going to have to be a pretty basic essential of building a house. What part could I leave off? Paint? Paint could wait, you know. But the problem is then people are going to think my house is pretty ugly. So, I, yeah, I'm going to paint. I, mean, I can't leave that off. Uh, landscaping, flowers. That really could wait, right? No, because people are really going to think my house is ugly if I don't have some good landscaping around there. So really, what is something that I can leave off of this house project that nobody's going to see? Foundation, right. Nobody will see that. <laughs> so you build a house sans foundation. Will people see that you don't have a foundation? At first, no, right? It's underground. You can't see it. But will people see the results of not having a foundation? Absolutely. They're going to see the results. So when, when this talks about a foundation, the very nature of a foundation is something you can't see. It's something that's laid at the beginning, but the actual item is not necessarily visible. So in this building of a house of character, in even the process of education, the world teaches us to focus on the external. Think about worldly education. Grades, honors, rewards, stars, ten, what, you name it. Teachers have a million methods of external reward, drawing attention to the performance. We even do this, though, in spiritual things. The child can get up front and recite his memory verses or do a special music. Yeah, they have a good character. No, 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 no. <laughs> That's just the flowers around the building and just the paint on the walls, right? The foundation is laid in the things that people don't see. The foundation is laid in the home. The foundation is laid in that careful instruction by mom and dad. The foundation is laid in those little everyday occurrences, those everyday duties, those everyday chances to learn a little bit of unselfishness that helps develop a character. Later on, people will see it. But initially, it's not very visible. We're also told the Bible should be made the foundation of education. The Bible should be made the foundation of study and teaching. The Bible should be the child's first textbook. From this book, parents are to give wise instruction. The word of God is to be made the rule of life. And there's much more that we could look at there. Instead of confining their study to that which men have said or written, let students be directed to the sources of truth. We spend so much time in education pointing our children and students to things that other people have already written up and designed and created. We need to bring them to the source. We need to go to the source of wisdom, connect them with the Lord and the Bible and nature. By some, education is placed next to religion, but true education is religion. Don't we always do this, though? <laughs> not, not trying to be critical, but this is a, a common way that we do it. We have our regular classes, and then we have Bible class. Education next to religion. 
who says, no, true education is religion. It should be so interwoven with everything we do that you can't separate it. Okay, but let's talk about this second point. True education is the harmonious development of the physical, mental, and spiritual powers. What does the word harmonious mean? I know we have a, a few lovers of music here. What does harmonious mean? What, what, give me a definition of this word. Complimentary. Complimentary. Okay, that's good. Balanced. Balanced. All right. What was that? Working together. Working together. In, agreement. in agreement. I like this. Yeah. It's an equilibrium. Okay. Balanced is, is a very good uh, word to use there. I mean, let's just take a, a quartet. We've all heard some good quartets, I'm sure. If one day that tenor decides he's going to sing more loudly than everyone else, is it harmonious? No, it's gone from harmonious to not harmonious, disharmonious. <laughs> so as we speak of harmonious development of the physical, mental, and spiritual powers, they're going to be in equilibrium, working together. But what does the world usually focus on? What does the worldly methods focus on? Mental, definitely the mental. True education is the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and spiritual powers. Education page 13. So let's talk about these a little bit individually. We find a fascinating statement that, well, actually, well, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll go with that. Both mental and spiritual vigor are in a great degree dependent upon physical strength and activity. Whatever promotes physical health promotes the development of a strong mind and a well-balanced character. Fascinating. God created us with these three areas. And I find it interesting that there's three. God is, there's a Godhead of three, right? God created man with three areas, the physical, mental, and the spiritual, and that made up the harmonious whole. And that was part of the image of God. So if the image of God has been destroyed, we need to restore equally the physical, mental, and spiritual. But it tells us here that two of the areas are dependent upon a third. It says mental and spiritual are dependent upon physical. I need a little bit of help here. I don't know your name, brother. Can you come up and... Thomas, can you give me a hand? And was it David, Daniel? All right, I need one of you to stand on each side of me. We're just going to do a little representation here of the three areas of our being. So for sake of illustration, we're going to have spiritual, mental, and I'm going to represent physical. So I want both of you to put your elbow on my shoulder and support yourself against me. All right, now lift up the leg closest to me so you're really leaning on me. All right, here we have a representation of what we're just reading about here, that the mental and the spiritual are dependent upon the physical. I don't know why, that's just God, how God created it. Now, what would happen if I jumped out of the way right now? Not good. <laughs> Not good. It wouldn't, this whole system, this, this, which is functioning pretty well, I'm not too stressed, but... These two are leaning against me, but if I were to remove myself, this whole unit would just collapse. All right? Now, I won't do that. Thanks, guys, for the illustration. So if we want strong mental powers, where do we begin? With the physical. If we want strong spiritual powers, where do we begin? With the physical. And this is why, I don't have a quote here, but... We're told in the Spirit of Prophecy that in the first few years of a child's life, the mother should focus on the spiritual and the, the physical development, and especially focuses on laying a sound physical constitution that enables the spiritual and mental development. But we get it backwards often, don't we? <laughs> By trying to start with the mental, but we haven't laid a good foundation in the physical. And there's so much science. We could spend hours talking about all the science that shows the benefits of physical activity. It's been found to improve the overall mental health and quality of life, enhance brain function and cognition, improve behavior, improve concentration, increase the blood and oxygen flow to the brain, increase the levels of norepinephrine and endorphins, which result in a reduction of stress and an improvement of mood, Increase growth factors that help create new nerve cells and support synaptic plasticity. What a list. All from the Journal of the American Medical Association of Pediatrics. 
Another study found that exercise provides an unparalleled stimulus, creating an environment in which the brain is ready, willing, and able to learn. Don't, isn't that what we want, right? Brains ready, willing, and able to learn? You've got to get the exercise. But of course, how much? That is a good question to ask. How much is a proper amount? We find in both research and the spirit of prophecy that we should divide the time. And she says elsewhere that it should be divided equally. The time of study must be divided between the gaining of book knowledge and the securing of a knowledge of practical work. Now, when you divide something, what does that usually indicate? Half and half, right? You, you divide it in equal portions. Imagine one day you're at home and uh, getting ready to enjoy the last piece of a healthy vegan cake. I don't know if that's possible. And uh, so <laughs> you are getting ready to enjoy this. You put it on the plate, you take a fork, you go to sit down at the table, and you're just, your mouth is watering as you start to take that bite and you hear a knock on the door. Well, it's, just, it's your good friend who doesn't really bother for you to answer the door, and he just comes right on in. You have some cake. Let's share this, shall we? I knew you were going to say that. All right, sure, we'll share it. So you go to the kitchen, you get a knife, you get another fork and a plate, you come back and your friend says, all right, divide it. Okay, I'll divide it. And you cut a tiny, tiny little sliver off the edge. It's translucent, you can see through it, and you put it on his plate. There you go. What's he going to say? <laughs> I said divide it. Well, I did divide it. <laughs> well, your math's not very good, right? I wonder if we do that to the Lord sometimes, though. He says, divide your time between the gaining of a book knowledge and the securing of a knowledge of practical work. And again, elsewhere in the Spirit of Prophecy, it does actually say divide it equally. And it is interesting to note, it says securing a knowledge of practical work. This isn't just exercise. You're running on a treadmill for four hours so you can study for four hours. No, practical work. Doing dishes and, and, and working outside and in the garden, all these things, that counts toward that time of practical work. Um, but again, dividing the time, and I should specify, this is uh, more applicable to the older child. We're going to talk about this more tomorrow, but after around age 10 is when this is applicable to. As we've already mentioned, though, we need to lay the foundation in physical development. So Prior to age 10, we're spending much more time, if not almost all the time, in physical activity. Now, physical training could be further divided into three important areas, uh, one of them being useful work. What is useful work? Washing dishes, doing the laundry, cleaning the house, taking care of chores outside, things like that. God has given that to us for our happiness. And I find it interesting that we're told the greatest benefit is not gained from exercise that's taken as play or exercise merely. Isn't that what the world does, though? Worldly systems of education? It's play or exercise merely. Competitive sports, which are totally against the principles of God's kingdom, or just exercise for the sake of exercise. There is some benefit in being in the fresh air and also from the exercise of the muscles, but let the same amount of energy be given to the performance of useful work and the benefit will be greater. Now, let's think about this. It says the same amount of energy given to useful work. Have you ever seen a group of children playing soccer? How much energy are they putting into it? A lot. But when it's time to weed the garden, for some reason, that energy is gone, right? <laughs> we're not going to find the same benefit unless we're putting equal energy and enthusiasm into the work. But that is where we will find the greatest benefit. There's a lot more that we could get into, but we're running out of time. Every man, woman, and child should be educated to practical, useful work. Anyone left out? <laughs> no, this is every one of us. Manual training is more specific to training a particular skill or a trade. I've heard you've been doing that here at this church. That's great. Manual training is deserving of far more attention than it has received. And if you look at the nation of Israel, God gave them specific directions that every young person was to be given a skill or a trade, even if he might not need to use it. It was part of his education, essential for his character development. Every youth on leaving school should have acquired a knowledge of some trade or occupation by which, if need be, he may earn a livelihood. But what's the best form of manual training? 
No line of manual training is of more value than agriculture. I have an entire hour presentation on the benefits of agriculture, and it could be much more than that. Let me just touch on a few quick points. Why has God given us agriculture as one of the, well, it says the best form of manual training? So much science now showing us benefits of of agriculture. They found that children who were involved in gardening had better self-confidence and self-esteem. To clarify, that's not a prideful thing. That's in the context of the science. This is talking about that sense of self-worth. Very important. They're more patient and persevering. Did we need a million-dollar study to tell us that? (laughs) You cannot get your smartphone, push a few buttons, and tomatoes come out. It just doesn't work that way, right? If you want some good tomatoes, you're going to have to plant them and care for them and water them and weed them and pray over them. And with the Lord's blessing, you'll get a harvest. So, of course, it teaches patience and perseverance. Children had improved science understanding. Again, that's pretty obvious. Better test scores, and they were overall better learners. One study found an experimental group of garden of gardening students outperformed a control group of non-gardening students in all areas. General information, reading recognition, reading comprehension, total reading, mathematics, spelling, and written language. What does any of that have to do with gardening? (laughs) Well, nothing really, but being in the garden was so strengthening to their mind that they were actually doing better in their academic studies. Now, there's a fascinating little bacteria called Mycobacterium vacai. Anyone heard of this one? All right. There's good bacteria and bad bacteria in the world, right? (laughs) And we want plenty of the good bacteria. This is a good bacteria. This bacteria has been found to reduce depression. That's a benefit right there. To improve lung health. Could we use some of that in this world today? (laughs) Definitely. To boost the immune system. To fight cancer. Who's wanting some of this already? To strengthen the digestive system treat arthritis, improve emotional and mental health, lower stress and anxiety, reduce allergies, and even raise IQ and make you smarter. Who wants some Mycobacterium vacai? (laughs) Where do you get it from? Well, unfortunately, you're not going to find it in a pill at the health food store. You're going to have to go to your garden. It is a component of the soil in which we grow our gardens. No, you don't need to eat dirt. You can just put your hands in the soil. You can go barefoot in the garden. You can harvest the vegetables right out of the garden, and you'll get small amounts of this bacteria. They even find that breathing the dust that gets kicked up on a, when it's dry, you'll get some of this bacteria, and it's actually very beneficial for the immune system. They found that children living on farms have half the incidence of allergies and asthma compared to, to children living in uh, more urban areas, more uh, city areas and they have linked it to the dust that gets kicked up on the farms by the machinery and walking and whatnot, just being around that dirt, it actually was triggering the immune system to be healthier and reducing allergies and asthma. Incredible. God designed us to live outdoors. They found that this bacteria had the exact same effect as antidepressant drugs. Note the title of the study is Dirt, the New Prozac. Again, a lot more research we could look at that. Uh, Is there some math you can learn in the garden? Yeah, so you can start incorporating some academic subjects. Plenty of math you could learn in the garden. How about science? Yeah, lots of science you could learn in the garden. And this is one of the great benefits of country living. Uh, One of the great benefits of being in that environment that God placed us in originally. We're told the Garden of Eden was not only Adam's dwelling, but his schoolroom. And I love that. It can be our schoolroom too today. Studying agricultural lines should be the A, B, and C of the educational work in our school. This is the very first work that must be entered upon. Very first. But I don't know how many schools I've worked with <laughs> or spoken with who say, you know, once we get our, our buildings up and once we get our, you know, our, our teacher base established, our student base established, and get things organized, once we have the time, we'll get the agriculture program going. No, 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 that's backwards. So start with the agriculture program, then build on the other things. I was talking with a friend of mine who uh, was a teacher, and we were just lamenting how we've been removing the agriculture programs from our schools and how, just how sad it is. And uh, my friend said, you know, what's the reason they're doing this? I said, well, the reason there that I've heard so many times is that the agriculture program is not making any money. 
And my friend said, yeah, that's absolutely right. That's the reason I've been hearing too. He said, wait a second though. I've never heard anybody complain that history class is not making us money. Nobody says, well, math class isn't making money. We'll have to get rid of that. Why do we ask the question about the agriculture? It's because we're viewing math and science and history as fundamental to education. So we don't care if it's making money or not. But the agriculture, we view that as optional. So if it's making money, we'll keep it, but otherwise we'll have to get rid of it. But we should view agriculture as fundamental to education. It doesn't matter if it's making money. Although it has a lot greater potential to make money than history class. <laughs> All right, let's talk about mental culture for a moment. The world focuses heavily on mental culture. Uh, we don't really need much encouragement to study and develop the mind. But what's interesting is that the mental culture of the world is very self-centered and very one-sided. It develops heavily the memory uh, areas of the brain, which actually lead to uh, diminishing the ability to think and to reason and make decisions. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. But it is also a very self-centered thing. You know, in the world it is about getting that degree and getting those honors and beating someone else so you can get the best job and so you can graduate with, with uh, you know, titles and get the nice house and the nice car and all these things that point to you, point to myself, point to being selfish. Can the Christian reach for high attainments? Yeah. But what's his purpose in reaching for a high attainment? He is a Christian who aims to reach the highest attainments for the purpose of doing others good. Our purpose here on this earth is to benefit others, and that is our reason for uh, seeking to reach those high attainments. So this is another area that we need to change in education. We read, it is not well to crowd the mind with studies that require intense application, but that are not brought into use in practical life. Now, we really run the risk of doing this even in supposedly true educational circles. Such an education will be a loss to the student. It is not enough even to have knowledge. We must have the ability to use the knowledge aright. We need to ask that question about anything we're studying, any program. Can I use this? Can I put this into practice to benefit someone else? If it's just information crammed into the mind, the Spirit of Prophecy tells us that will actually weaken the mind. And I find it interesting, the book Studies in Christian Education, written by one of our great educational pioneers, E.A. Sutherland. Anyone read the book Studies in Christian Education? All right, <laughs> a couple of you. Powerful look at true versus false education. He talks about the papal system of education extensively and the methods of operation. The papal system of education makes teachers content to repeat set lessons to their students as they themselves learn them in school with no thought of making practical application. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> that's, that's standard practice. The students, in turn, go out to teach others the same rote they have learned, and thus the endless treadmill goes on, ever learning but never getting anywhere. And friends, that's exactly how Satan would have it. Satan would be happy for us to live like good Christians, educating our children like good Christians, and going generation after generation after generation, almost following true education. Because the true purpose of education is to fit workers to finish the work on this earth. But Satan doesn't want that. So he's happy for us to just to keep learning. What does the Bible say? Ever learning but never coming to a knowledge of the truth? Treadmill. Satan's happy for that. Because he knows as soon as true education accomplishes its purpose in finishing the work on this earth, he's done. That's why it is the use they make of knowledge that determines the value of their education. All right, spiritual development, we've covered uh, pretty extensively already. Let's just re be reminded that a character formed according to the divine likeness is the only treasure that we can take from this world to the next. How important then is the development of character in this life? And any effort that exalts intellectual culture above moral training is misdirected. And we get to our third and final point. True education is preparation for service here and throughout eternity. True education prepares the student for the joy of service in this world and the higher joy of wider service in the world to come. True education is 
Who likes definitions? <laughs> Let's just make this simple. True education is, what is true education? Can anyone finish the sentence according to some definitions we've already looked at? Harmonious development. True education is harmonious development of physical, mental, and spiritual. Absolutely. Could we put in redemption? True education is redemption. How about restoring the image of God in the soul? Yeah, all these things. There are several definitions of true education because it's a broad topic. Here it says true education is missionary training. Wow, how simple is that? Are we preparing our young people to be missionaries? Now, what kind of missionaries? We'll talk about that in a minute. Every son and daughter of God is called to be a missionary. We are called to the service of God and our fellow men, and to fit us for this service should be the object of our education. Okay, so what kind of missionary labor? It is necessary to their complete education that students be given time to do missionary work. This tells us something very important. It says given time. In other words, this is a part of the program. This is a part of the curriculum to do missionary work. But what kind of missionary work? Are we sending them off to Africa every couple of weeks to try? I mean, that'd be pretty impractical. Continuing, same paragraph, different slide here. Time to become acquainted with the spiritual needs of the families in the community around them. Well, that's possible, isn't it? And this word acquaintance is absolutely key. In the book Education, it tells us that it is acquaintance that awakens sympathy, and sympathy is the spring or the source of an effective ministry. Acquaintance awakens sympathy. Sympathy is the source of ministry, effective ministry. Imagine, uh, just for example, every day you see a man walking past your house. Do you feel sorry for him? Want to go help him? You're thinking, why would I, right? <laughs> you don't know the person. Why is he walking past your house? It doesn't really matter to you, so you don't feel sorry for him. But imagine one day you're out, I don't know, getting the mail or whatever, and the man comes walking by, and you strike up a conversation with him. And you learn that this man is, uh, recently his father has died, and his mother is also really sick. And so that's where he's going every day. He's going to take care of his mother, his sick mother, bring her what she needs and care for her. But why is he walking? Well, his car broke down. He, did, he doesn't have the money to fix it. And furthermore, he's hurt his foot, and so he's in pain as he's walking every day to go help his sick mother. Now do you feel sorry for him? Of course, right? And what are you going to do? Well, with the love of Jesus in your heart, you're going to try to help him out, right? So your acquaintance with him awakens sympathy in your heart. And that became the source of an effective ministry. Missionary labor will never be effective unless we come into acquaintance with those who need our help. But more than that, it is that acquaintance that will awaken a desire for missionary effort in our young people. We can't just tell them about the work that needs to be done. We need to help bring them in contact with those needs. There's an appropriate age for various aspects of that. And so that's certainly to be kept in mind. In the early years, it, certainly, or it should primarily be in, within the home, learning the lessons of unselfishness. And then as they grow, they're brought into more acquaintance with the needs around them. They should not be so loaded down with studies that they have no time to use the knowledge they have acquired. Now that tells us what kind of knowledge they're acquiring in school, right? It must be about doing missionary labor. They should be encouraged to make earnest missionary effort for those in error, becoming acquainted with them and taking to them the truth. Is there a place for foreign mission service, though? Absolutely. From our colleges and training schools, missionaries are to be sent forth to distant lands. While at school, let the students improve every opportunity to prepare for this work. How do we do this? We're told when the youth give their hearts to God, your care for them should not cease. <laughs> this is what we usually do, though, isn't it? We work so hard to help them give their hearts to the Lord. Finally, they're baptized, they're committed to the Lord, and we're like, whew, job is finished. No, it says your care for them should not cease. What is next? Lay some special responsibility upon them. And I believe that's more than taking up offering at church, <laughs> as important as that is. No, it begins to explain. Make them feel they are expected to do something. You're part of the Lord's army now. Let's get to work. Let different branches of the missionary work 
different branches, right? It's not all about that trip to Africa or something like that. This is that acquaintance in the community. This is many different areas of missionary work. Lay it out systematically and let instruction and help be given so that the young may learn to act apart. You're a worker in the Lord's cause. Okay, let's find something for you to do. And of course, the more the family can do that the, together, the better. We read at the beginning that now as never before, we need to understand the true science of education. If we fail to understand this, we shall never have a place in the kingdom of God. Have we seen just a little bit of how important true education is? There's a solemn statement from Fundamentals of Education 541 that says, Satan's object is effectually gained when, by perverting their ideas of education, he succeeds in enlisting young people on his side. Is that what that says? We focus a lot on Satan's attacks on our young people. And true, that's important. But it says he succeeds in enlisting parents and teachers on his side. For a wrong education often starts the mind on the road to infidelity. Satan's pretty smart. He knows he'll only have a certain amount of success going after the young people, but he'll have a, great, a much greater degree of success by going after the parents and teachers and twisting their minds of education because he'll affect a, great, uh, a larger class of young people. So where does true education begin? With the children or with the parents? It starts with the parents, doesn't it? It was the year 1938. And Dr. Toshio Yamagata and Elder Francis Millard of the Japan Union Mission were visiting Dr. Mizuno, the great uh, leader of social and religious education for the nation of Japan. These men were there from the Adventist Mission to ask permission from Dr. Mizuno to keep their school open. This was 1938, after all. And in the nation of Japan, many of the parochial and private and religious schools around the nation were being closed. And so these men were there from the Adventist mission to ask permission to keep their school open. They had to give it their best pitch to convince this government leader why it was an essential school. They began to explain their unique system of education, one very much like what we've just studied tonight. They told that government leader that they were following a plan of education which would prepare useful and practical citizens for the country, but most of all, they were focused on preparation for heaven. They were focused on harmonious development of the mental, the physical, and the spiritual. They were preparing their young people for service. And as they finished up explaining, they had the book Education. And they said, Dr. Mizuno, actually, if you'd like to better understand our plan, you could just read this book. Dr. Mizuno said, that's okay. I don't need to read your book because I've already read it. He said, I found that book in a library when I was in university many years ago. And I said, that is the most amazing thing on education I've ever read. <laughs> and he said, we need more schools like that. And he spoke directly to those Adventist leaders. He said, look, if you follow your plan like I read it in this book, you have no reason to worry. You can keep your school open. But if you depart from that plan, you have no reason to even exist and we'll shut you down. We've been given a plan. And we've been given a plan for health, for evangelism, for our lifestyle, for so many areas of our lives. Not the least of which is our plan on education. It's a plan that might generate some persecution it's a plan that might bring some ridicule. It's definitely a plan that's going to separate us from the world. But it is a plan designed and given us by God for the accomplishment of a special purpose. That being to finish the work so that Jesus can come. 
He's told us we could do it in one generation if we just follow his plan. But if we don't follow his plan, why are we here? What is our reason for existence? Light is light because it is different from the darkness. But if we're seeking to be like the world around us, <laughs> we're gathering darkness about ourselves and we're taking away our very reason to be here. God has placed us in this earth as a peculiar people. And if we seek to be like the world around us, we're just taking away the very reason for our existence. So let's embrace the plan. Amen? There's a lot more we could look at. We're well over time. <laughs> I hope everyone has a good night's sleep tonight because we're going to have a full day tomorrow looking at many principles of true education. So let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, how grateful we are for your plan. Lord, where would we be without your counsel? We're so thankful <clears throat> for making it so clear for us in these last days with our minds so darkened. Help us to read, help us to study, and help us to apply and to obey this counsel that you've given us, Lord. Thank you for it. Please go with us now as we go back to our homes. Please keep us safe and bring us back together again tomorrow for continued study on your plan of education. And I ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.